golden rule. Right? Huh? Treat others as you want to be treated, pretty much, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the rich one, rich is the man with the gold makes all the rules. <laughs> well, sadly enough, in the world, right, right. you know what I mean? It seems that way, doesn't it? That the person with all the, all the money gets to make all the rules. <coughs> but uh, <coughs> that's not the way it is in the kingdom of God. The golden rule is that we should treat others the way that we want to be treated. And we, we do that, why? Do we want to be treated good? <laughs> Sometimes it seems like it's, uh, we don't think too well of ourselves. We might say it coming out of our mouths, but inside, internally, um, we can beat up on ourselves pretty good. But I would say that deep down, we all want to be treated nice, right? We want to be treated good. And uh, in order to do that, I'd say we should also treat others that way, shouldn't we? The golden rule. What's more is uh, we need to love each other. And there is a whole a major difference between the two. Uh, they're not separate, but love and like are really two different things. Uh, you guys that have been here for a while, I, I would say, are getting to know me pretty, pretty well. Um, and I say this out of the, with true honesty from my heart, is that I love each and every one of you. And, uh, and that's just the way things are today for me. There was a, a day in my, in my life, there was a time in my life, uh, for most of my life, where I could care about anybody else. Like, that just didn't, it really meant nothing to me, uh, maybe my immediate family. Um, but that was because I was a person living in the world. And, and I was living by the world standards, which pretty much tell us that you get everything you can for yourself, and you really don't care that much about what other people are doing. Uh, my relationships, and I'm sure a lot of you can <laughs> relate to this, is my relationships that I might have called friendships were more one-sided because it was about what I could get from that relationship, what was my end of the deal. Um, where that doesn't come in anymore. And that's where we need to be, see. Um, when Martin Luther King was staging these marches and, and, and uh, standing up for people that were looked down upon and were being oppressed, do you think that he was doing that for, to gain power and prestige? I don't think so. But if you look in the world today, I'd say that's the case with most, if not just about all, of our politicians and even some of these other people that are supposedly uh, advocates for their fellow man. The way of the world and God's way are two totally different things. And love is God's way. When we have true love, for our fellow man, right? We care for each other out of that love. And that's what we're going to look at this morning. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you. I thank you, Lord, for your love. I thank you, Father, that we have an opportunity to know this love. I thank you, Father, that we have the ability uh, to choose to know you and your will for our lives, not the way of this world that has caused us so much pain and confusion. We can shed ourselves from that way 
and know and follow your way and your will for our life. We can know love, true love. Help us, Father. We live here, in this world, full of the lies and the sin and the confusion that are of this world, Lord. But we pray that you, as you speak to us, Lord, as your Holy Spirit, as, your, as the Counselor speaks to us this morning, Father, I pray that we're able to put aside our ideas that are brought about because of our thinking. But we listen to you with our hearts. And we allow you to speak to us and show us your way and your will this morning. And we also pray, Father, that you give us the strength not only to hear, but to be, be obedient by applying that to our lives. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Jesus' name. Amen. I, I love this portion of Scripture especially because it kind of reminds me, and, and the way of the world today really is nothing new, see, because it's all the way through. It wouldn't really be referenced in there if it wasn't true in that day either. Right? The religious leaders of the time were, you know, thinking of themselves as being way up here and enforcing their, their will upon the followers. No different, right? The other thing we see today is even within the church today, we see, and there's beautiful songs about it too. I, one called uh, The Face of Christ where even in our churches today, people aren't accepted because of maybe how they look or how they dress or how they smell. One of the things I love about the Salvation Army is that's why it's here. That's why the Salvation Army exists because back in the mid-1800s, a lot of the churches wouldn't allow people into their buildings into their meetings because of the way they looked or acted or smelled. But William Booth went and pulled them out from underneath the bridge. I like that. How many people say, well, I don't want to see your hands, but those of us that have slept under a bridge before understand what that's like. Pulled them out from underneath the bridge and invited them back to his church, but they were not accepted. So he started the Salvation Army so that they would have a place to come and to worship God and feel accepted. Martin Luther King was trying to help those people that weren't being accepted. They are being looked down at. And that comes from a love that we have when we come into a relationship with God. Our old nature, which is the nature of this world, which would tell us to separate yourself from certain people, stick with your little crowd, don't worry about anybody but yourself. See, that needs to go. That needs to go. I think I've mentioned this before, but one of the craziest things you could say to yourself when you come into a program like this is, I came here by myself, I'm going to care for myself, and I'm going to leave here by myself. I don't care about any of you. That's ridiculous, man. It just doesn't work that way. We're a group, a body of believers. The church is what? Body of believers, right? Like-minded. Seeking after the same goal. Are we not? Yes, when we come into a program like this, right? We come in, hopefully, wanting to change from the life that you are living that has caused you to need a facility like this. We all come in for the same reason. We're all here together. There's a reason why God has us working this way. 
because that's how it works. One of the main sayings, right, in AA and NA and 12-step groups is what? You can't keep it unless you what? You got to give it away. There's a big, re there's a reason for that. You have to work to. I'm big on accountability too. We need to not only be accountable for ourselves, but for each other. Lifting each other up. Dusting each other off. <clears throat> patting each other on the back. Not taking each other's inventories. Right? But looking out for each other. You see a guy sitting in a corner. Right? You can tell he's all bummed out, probably thinking about what's going on outside. You're sitting there watching TV. What do you do? You watch TV? Or do you get up maybe and go over and at least acknowledge, yo, you all right? See, that's how it works, man. Now, our old nature, we were sitting on a sidewalk, right, with a bottle. Some guy goes by and says, hey, can I get some of that? You get away from me, man. You know what I'm saying? See, that's the old nature. We have to put that behind us. New nature has to come about. One of love. <clears throat> love for each other. For our fellow man. <clears throat> love and light. Now, don't be misled. I'm telling you. I'll tell you, I love each and every one of you. You know, when I give you a hug, I mean that, that hug is out of love. But I'll tell you, there's a lot of stuff you guys do I don't like. <laughs> Let's see, what, what don't I like? I don't like foul language. Uh, there's a lot of stuff. But there's a reason why I don't like that stuff. Because I don't think it's good for you. I don't think it's good for you. As a matter of fact, there's things that I hate. But it's okay. Even Christ shown anger in the money changers, right? In the temple. It's okay to hate sin, but you never hate the sinner. It's okay, right, to dislike someone's actions, but you never dislike the person. See, because out of God's love, that's not what it's about, man. You think Jesus hated that guy that was the money changer? Of course not, but he hated that action. He hated what that person was doing, and he wanted that person to change just as he wants each and every one of us to change. Why do you think Jesus ate with the tax collectors and the sinners? It wasn't because he wanted to be like them. It wasn't because he agreed with what they were doing. You hear that over and over again. Well, Jesus, even Jesus ate with the, with the sinners. Jesus, well, you know, that's true love. No, that's true love, yes. But it's not because he agreed with what they were doing. It's because he cared about what they were doing. And he wanted them to change. And that's what we need to take a look at today. We need to look at the changes that we need to make. How do we see ourselves? And how do we see our fellow man? Because if it's still all about us and we could care less about somebody else, you have no program. You're not going anywhere. It has to change. My dear brothers and sister, how can you claim you have faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ if you favor some people more than others? Suppose someone comes in to your meeting, dressed in fancy clothes and expensive jewelry, and another comes who is poor and dressed in shabby clothes. If you give special attention and a good seat to the rich person, but say to that poor one, you can stand over there, or else just go sit on the floor. Doesn't this discrimination show that you are guided by wrong motives? Of course it does. How many people kind of snickered when they seen somebody walking in the front door, coming in the program, all still messed up looking? Still dressed in the clothes they've had on for two weeks. How many 
Mahila said, man, let him sit over there. But yeah, it was us walking in the door probably weeks, maybe months earlier, mm -hmm. looking and smelling the same way. Good. Listen to me, dear brothers and sisters. Hasn't God chosen the poor in this world to be rich in faith? Aren't they the ones that will inherit the kingdom he promised to those who love him? And yet you insult the poor man. <clears throat> Since participation in recovery may lead to rejection by others, the process can be painful. Old friends may reject us for trying to escape our bondage. Sometimes a Christian community <coughs> or society at large may reject us treating us like unworthy outcasts because of the prejudice. We all need acceptance. Jesus intended for the Christian community to graciously accept and love people, whether they are wealthy and influential or poor and homeless. We need to welcome outcasts who are honestly struggling with their problems. Jesus calls us to treat others just as we want them to. To treat us. Amen. And that's Matthew 7, 12. Treat others the same way we want to be treated. Do unto others as you would have them to do unto you. And I know that's been twisted around a bit too, right? We can take that the to whole other way. Right? I hear it saying, do unto others before they do unto you. But that's the way of the world. And that's the difference between the two. We are not only to know God in our lives, we are not only to seek God in our lives, but we are to act, right? As God is instructing us. We are to love each other, whether they act different or act the same. Whether, whether they do things that we don't like, or whether they do everything the same we, way we do. We still are to love. And it's not something that you can force upon yourself, see. But this love comes naturally through this change that comes about when we make that decision, the decision to turn our will and our life over to God. And we do that through the acceptance of His Son, Christ Jesus. See, we receive the Comforter then, the Counselor, that guides us in this new life. That one said that's. I'd say that's the most misused uh, twelve-step quote, and I believe it's in the basic text as well as the big book where it says it's a selfish program. Selfless. Hmm. You don't say selfish. Say selfless. Selfless. <coughs> where did I see it say selfish program? I kept that in my head for the longest time, thinking how mixed, mixed up that is. Yeah. But that's crazy, see? Because it's not. We have to interact. We have to, beyond just coexist, we need to cohabitate. <laughs> we need to help each other. We need to work with each other. We need to help each other. Lift each other up. Strengthen each other. James chapter 2 goes on through verse 14 all the way through to the end talking about faith and works. And faith is are coming into that relationship with God and the works then are that which comes naturally because of that relationship 
But works are not something that we put on ourselves to try to get right with God. <clears throat> they come through a nature change and be out of our love for a fellow man. Dear brothers and sisters, what's the use of saying you have faith if you don't prove it by your actions? What kind of faith, that kind of faith can't save you. Suppose you see a brother or a sister who needs food or clothing and you say, well, goodbye, God bless you, stay warm and eat well. But then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? You see, it isn't enough just to have faith. Faith doesn't just show itself by good deeds. <clears throat> faith doesn't just show itself by good deeds is no faith at all. Faith that doesn't show itself by good deeds is no faith at all. It is dead and useless. And what that means is you can't keep it unless you give it away. It has to be shared. Now someone may argue, some people have faith, others have good deeds. And I say, I can't see your faith if you don't have good deeds. But I will show you my faith through my good deeds. Do you still think it's enough just, be, just to believe that there is a God? Well, even the demons believe this, and they tremble in terror. Fool, will you ever learn that faith does not result in good deeds, that does not result in good deeds is useless. So in other words, we can't just sit back and say that we have God in our lives without living it. Faith is the cornerstone of recovery. It needs to be accompanied by action. Some of us may have found it easy to admit we needed God's help, but when called upon, to actively prove our faith, we refused. <coughs> we all have made commitments that we failed to back up with our actions. James left us this powerful reminder. Faith that doesn't show itself by good deeds is no faith at all. It is dead and useless. If we believe in principles of recovery but refuse to act upon them, we are not in recovery. <laughs> If we believe God can help us, but refuse to obey His will, we prove that our faith is dead. True faith in God expresses itself in committed actions. Our actions need to back up our words if we want to succeed in recovery. So it's not just about listening. It's about doing. It's not just about hearing, but it's about believing and being obedient by following that direction. True love is not just about us and maybe a chosen few. True love is a love for all mankind, for each and every person. You might not like the way they act at times, but that's okay. You can pray for that person and have concern for that person. You can hate the sin but not the sinner. Martin Luther King loved his fellow man. And he might have hated the way they acted, but he loved them. Even those that were throwing things at him and calling him names, even the man that shot him. That's what love is. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for us. We can know your love. We can experience your love. And we can live your love by not only caring for and about ourselves and our relationship with you, but caring for each and every person we come into contact with. Even caring for those that we don't. We see the needs on the news. And our heart goes out. But help us, Lord, to not just say, eat well and God bless you. Help us to do something about it. It's so much more than just knowing you. It's
trying our best to be like you. We see your nature in your Son, Christ Jesus. We can read for ourselves and we can study his life and how he acted and interacted, how he loved his fellow man, and how we might always come up short. We can strive for that. We can thirst for that. <clears throat> we can desire. And we can try our best to follow that. You give us everything we need, Lord. But we live here. You know that. Help us, Father, this morning to make that decision, Lord, that from this day forward we will try our best to be like Jesus. And I thank you, Lord, that it, it's not that hard when we have a maintained relationship with you. It's not impossible. All things are possible through you who gives us strength that we need. So I pray that we make a decision this day to seek the knowledge of your will for our lives and the power to carry it out in all that we do. That conscious contact with you in all that we do so that our old nature can stay behind us. <clears throat> that self-centered, self-pleasing person can be behind us, never to return, and we can come into this relationship and know what it's like to truly love. Help us, Lord, to accept that this morning. Help us to want it. Help us to know it and help us to live it. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray.